Welcome, everybody. My name is Wyatt Shields. I'm the city manager for the City of Falls Church. And this is our 14th uh, sit, uh, town hall meeting that we've had on the George Mason High School campus project. And we have typically held these on a Sunday, so we call it the Sunday series. And this one, in order to uh, avoid the, uh, the school education foundation's home tour we moved it to monday night um, and so tonight what we plan to do is provide an update on the 10 acre economic development project an update on the school design and construction uh, project we're joined by evan goldman with eya who will represent the development team and he will give a presentation on the project as it's gone through now board and commission comments for the special exception application. Carly Aubrey is our project manager, and she is here. She can answer any questions when we get to that phase of the program as well. Uh, before we turn it over to Dr. Noonan for a, an update on the school project, let me uh, just introduce uh, Mayor Tarter, and our members of council are here. So Mayor Tarter is here in the, in the back, uh, joined by Vice Mayor Mary Beth Connolly, Council Member Phil Duncan, Council Member Letty Hardy, and um, thank you all for being here. So we will um, go through what we hope will be about a half an hour or so of presentation materials and then have question and responses from that. And uh, let me just do one thing also before I turn it over to Dr. Noonan, just so we kind of know our audience. Um, how many have, for whom is this the sort of the first town hall meeting that you've come to on the project? Just one, but you know a lot about this already. Okay, all right. Um, that's important for us to know in terms of how we, how we kind of go through the background on the project. Who here is, uh, lives in the City of Falls Church for the project? Uh, and who lives in Fairfax County? Okay, good. So we, we want to have outreach to the county. This project is, is close to the border, and uh, we maintain mailing lists of our county residents also who have been plugged into the, pr the process. We're very glad you're here as well. So with that introduction, let me turn it over to Dr. Noonan for the first slides, and, um, and then uh, we'll take it from there. Thank you, Mr. Shields. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Thank you so much for coming out on a Monday night uh, as opposed to a Sunday afternoon. Hopefully you enjoyed the beautiful weather yesterday. Um, and thank you to our Ed Foundation um, for putting on such a great uh, homes tour yesterday. So especially Shea, Sharon Scholler, um, Debbie Hiscott, who did uh, some fantastic work. Um, for those of you that I haven't met, my name is Peter Noonan. I'm the superintendent of schools here in the city of Falls Church. And this evening, um, we are uh, in a really exciting place, I think, in, with respect to our school project, as we are getting to the end of our um, real design development phase and moving into construction drawing. So I want to, um, before, I, before I get into where we are with the schedule and some of those kinds of uh, notions that we're going to talk about tonight, I did want to just share again sort of the front rendering of the building um, and just to kind of orient you and give you some sense of where we are. Um, there are a couple of things missing here. Uh, we aren't missing students. Our students are there, which is really great um, because that's what this is being built for. Um, but what's missing in this picture are some of the trees. So um, you won't see some of the trees in this rendering. But what you will see um, are um, some bioretention ponds that are here in the front that will help with stormwater management. Um, on the back side, and the, the, this isn't really working very well, but this is the connection back here to Mary Ellen Henderson. Um, this, of course, is the front facing east. Um, respectively, this is the thin bar, and that is the fat bar, and this is the heart of the school. So as students walk up um, from the 10-acre development site or from the Kiss and Ride, which is kind of generally in this area, the bus drop-off as well, um, students will cross this area that has sort of multicolored um, concrete uh, finishes here that's called the Woonerf in the front of the school, walk up and then enter through that main lobby area. Just to remind everybody for safety and security purposes at the new high school, one of the things you'll find in this high school is we don't have 94 entrances to the school. Uh, we have very few, but this becomes the main entrance to the school. So students will enter this secured vestibule, um, check in with security. Uh, if they're coming during off hours, enter into the main office area here to the left, come in and then go back into the heart of the school. Um, on this roof level, this is a double height volume here, but on this roof level we have uh, a green vegetative roof. 
which we're really excited about. Um, one of the things that we're talking about is um, what what's going to go up there. And uh, one of the things that may go up back into this corner here is uh, our farm bot. Some of you might be familiar with our farm bot that uh, the Ed Foundation paid for uh, to, to, to help us and to really speak to our value in terms of sustainable uh, and renewable energy and farming. Uh, but the, the big things that sort of happen on the thin bar um, are we've got the main office, we've got uh, the cafeteria towards the back. On the next floor up, we have the media center library, we have a cafe, and then we get into on that third level, uh, academics on the third and the fourth level, and those cross here, third floor, or I'm sorry, third floor, fourth floor, and then the, the fat bar uh, also has a fifth floor. So um, not a lot has changed in terms of the rendering. Um, and there have been a few tweaks, uh, minor tweaks on the interior of the building. We've been working very closely with our architect Stantec and our builder Gilbane to really make some modifications based on feedback that we've received from the community and from our teachers. And we really feel like we're in a, a really great place with respect to um, our, our project here. So just to kind of um, give you some sense of where we are, um, as you may remember, um, I do, uh, in November of 2017, um, the bond referendum passed, and at that point we went out for qualifications uh, to our teams. We received and went through the RFP process, selected Gilbane, Stantec, and Quinn Evans. Uh, starting in January, right away, right out of the gate, um, we started gathering proposals, um, getting design input from the community. Um, into February, we got to the down select, uh, and the concept designs were developed. We moved into selection, and now we are into the detailed design phase of our process. Uh, we look like we're going to be able to um, move into construction drawings here within the next uh, two weeks, actually. We will move into construction drawings. And um, what's nice about this slide, even though it's not um, working very well, is um, if it had been working, you would have seen this long sort of um, flowing tan bar moving from left to right, showing that we, where we started to where we are now, actually we've come really far at sort of breakneck speed. And I want to I want to thank a few people in the room for that, um, starting with our school board who are here. And Greg Anderson, who's our board chair, uh, is here. Shannon Litton is here. We've got Sean. Vice chair. What did I say? Chair. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Well, in absence of the chair, you you know. Anyway, Greg Anderson, our vice chair. We've got Shannon Litton is here. Shauna Russell is here. Um, and we really appreciate your support moving through this process. And our really great friends. Uh, in the general government and the city government as well. Um, so we've come a long way, but kind of digging in just a little bit further um, to give you a bigger sense of kind of where we are. Um, we are again through the schematic design phase. We are through the design development phase and moving into the construction documents, which is the top uh, right there. Um, we are submitting permits uh, to the city. We've gone through now two rounds of comments uh, and our permit went in today, I think, our package, right? Sorry, revised site plan submission went in today. Um, and over the next um, two weeks, we will complete our uh, GMP-1, which is the greatest maximum price. And for those of you that aren't familiar with sort of that vernacular or terminology, um, what that means is that we are negotiating right now with um, the Gilbane, Stantec, Quinn Evans team around what is going to be in the package, if you will, um, once we decide what's going to go into the building. So, you know, we have to buy concrete, we have to buy steel, we have to buy, so, buy out some of these um, subs, and that will be part of GMP-1, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, but essentially what that GMP does is it identifies what is the top number that we're able to spend and what do they guarantee us will be the greatest amount that we'll pay for um, any kind of construction that we're doing absent some sort of major change order that would require a much greater conversation. So we anticipate uh, moving through GMP-1 and into GMP-2 um, starting in May and into August and then uh, in, once we're through GMP-1 uh, we will actually be on target uh, to start construction on June 14th and I said 11 o'clock in the morning the other day to a team of folks that were there and that actually got moved. Um, we're going to do it after the students leave but we're going to invite some <laughs> students to come um, but we are still on target for a June 14th groundbreaking at about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, so so we are, we're excited about that. A couple of things that I want to point out that are on the website um, that you can check out at any point in time, and I'll share that website with you again at the end. But if you go to FCCPS.org 
and go to the construction site, you'll find all of the documents that we've had um, up on those sites after the 14 series, uh, Sunday series that we've done, plus all the work that we've done in between. But you'll see things like, um, this is the status report for March. So you'll see up to date kind of some major milestones that we've accomplished, some of the things that we're working on in terms of our current work and then some upcoming milestones. We have a really nice dashboard on there that kind of gives you a sense of where are we with respect to, you know, pre-construction, schematic design, design development, construction drawings, and then permit approval is the green um, button there. Um, you'll see underneath that the new ground, the GMHS groundbreaking in three months, June of 2019, and then an overview. Uh, and then at the bottom, it's got really kind of a nice chart that kind of gives you a sense of where we are. So as much as we, as far as we've come in the last year, really again at incredible speed, uh, we still are sort of at the front end of the project. Um, what will be exciting is once we get to this groundbreaking point and we start moving through this, this phase of the project, new school opening, if we break ground uh, this summer, uh, will be in December of 2020, January 2021. Uh, and then all of the work will be complete, uh, and that includes the site work outside, because we'll take possession of the building first, then the site work will be completed uh, in, uh, shortly thereafter in that following summer. But again, you can check out um, this, this at, uh, at our website. So some of the engagement that we've done over the course of the last um, you know, nine, 12 months, um, we've done a lot of student engagement. We've met with um, all grade level students, but we've met with the entire ninth grade, for example. Um, we've met with our uh, student government, our Gay Straight Alliance is there, our CTE uh, programs. We've done a lot with our interagency coordination. Uh, we've held a number of campus coordinating committee meetings, which are general government, school, and then constituents from the community that come on uh, every fourth Friday morning at 730. Uh, we've done campus infrastructure meetings, which are bi-weekly meetings that are coordination meetings between the school project and the economic development project. We've had a number of meetings with the Virginia Department of Transportation. We've been meeting with, with our friend uh, Evan here, talking about the economic development project. Uh, we've met with building planners and code folks uh, and the like, and then done the reviews numbers of times with all of the staff at the high school. So our engagement in this process, even though it's only been a year, has, has been incredibly um, deep and meaningful, uh, and, and uh, we've gotten really nice feedback from the staff and from our, our parent community and others as well. So just a summary in terms of our budget. Um, as you recall, um, we were approved by the voters to spend $120 million uh, on this, or bonding for $120 million towards this project. Um, so we have sort of parsed that out into three big categories. The first is, uh, the $108 million cost uh, limit, um, construction cost limit, and that's what CCL stands for. So we will not engage in a GMP that will exceed that $108 million construction cost limit. Um, in addition to that, we have about $9.3 million in soft costs, and those are things for um, all of our architecture, our engineering. Um, we have Daisy Brangman, who is with us tonight from Brailsford and Dunleavy, who is our uh, owner's representative on this project and has done a fantastic job working with Gilbane, Stantec, and Quinn Evans on our behalf. Um, and she's the PM, part of the PM fees there. FF&E is furniture fixtures and equipment. So we have a budget in there for new furniture um, and any kind of equipment that we have needs for. And then there's an owner's contingency, which is part of that $9.3 million soft cost as well. And then $2.7 million in the financing and bond costs. So it, it costs money to borrow, to borrow money. And so $2.7 million of that is for that financing and bond insurance costs uh, for a total of $120 million. Um, as I indicated earlier, we're sort of in the final steps of negotiating the GMP with Gil Bain right now uh, to make sure that our, our CCL comes in at less than $108 million and um, feeling like we're, we're making some good progress with them at this moment in time. Um, so, so the Gilbane and contract commitments, um, the initial co contract commitment that we did make with them was a six and a half million dollar agreement. Um, and then we made an additional $1.25 million amendment to that construction um, piece. And that is to finalize all of the pre-construction work that needs to happen to be ready so that when uh, June comes, we're ready to break ground. Um, GMP1, which we are, are seeking to um, get approval from the school board on, on May 15th, will be for the amount of about $32.8 million. 
That, um, that $32.8 million is for contract authority. That means that we have the capacity then to go out and starting, start working with um, folks who do site work, that do foundations, that will do our geothermal work, the steel, the concrete, roofing, elevators. There's a long lead time for elevators, so we've got to buy out our elevators as early as we can. Uh, mechanical, electrical, and, and plumbing, or MEP, uh, fire protection and permit fees. And so those are, those are some things that we need to get out into the market early on uh, to be ready for. And then we'll come behind GMP-1 after May 15th at the August 30th timeline. Uh, again, we'll go back to the school board and ask them to authorize GMP-2. And that would be an estimate of about $67.45 million. And that would be for the balance of the trades. So everything else that needs to be done. So it's the finishes um, and, and some of the other things, the materials to to finalize the building. Um, so that just kind of gives you a sense of, of what we're going to be buying sort of when. Uh, and then in the uh, later time frame, then we'll start spending some of that FF&E money, the furniture, fixtures, and equipment, uh, as we move forward towards that December, January move-in date. And that's an important date for us because it's winter break, so we'll be able to move in during that period of time. Uh, and we'll, we'll be getting equipment in um, and be able to set that up in, in and around that time frame as well. So our GMP schedule, um, and again, I've sort of referenced this, um, but just to kind of review it one more time, um, and we are sort of at that point here of, of April 15th, but for those of you that haven't been with us, it gives you a sense of when we started with design development documents, estimates. Um, we've reconciled the estimates, and we're working through that right now, um, but now we're into the negotiation and recommendation to the school board uh, at their May 14th uh, date to... Uh, to provide authority for that GMP-1, uh, and they will review the first GMP draft at the May 7th, uh, at the May 7th meeting. So then we get into the second part, and again, kind of uh, so, sort of rehashing what I've already said, but the big idea here is that we're into construction drawings, and then when GMP-2 happens, and then approved and executed by uh, the school board and the superintendent in uh, that August time frame. So here's the website that I indicated is out there for anyone who wants to um, take a look at all of the information that we've been able to put up. Um, it's www.fccps.org forward slash campus project. If you just go to the .org, it's on our splash page and you can find the project information really easily. And once you get to that site, here's what you'll find is you'll find um, a very extensive question and answer page that we've put together. We've had over 600 questions and we've tried to answer every single one of them as they've come through. Uh, some of the latest events, upcoming dates and the like, document repository, the campus coordinating committee notes are there as well. Uh, the overview of our project and then the history uh, as well. So um, that is, that's what I have for you tonight uh, more than anything. It sort of um, lays out for you, I think, kind of where we are with respect to the project with, uh, with Gilbane, Stantec, and Quinn Evans, gives you some idea of schedule-wise where we are and then um, the, what, is, what is going into that first GMP package. So at this point, um, we have one more board member that joined us. I'd like to welcome Lawrence Webb. Thank you for being here as well. Uh, do you all have any questions for me before I turn it over to the... And if you do have questions, we're going to bring the mic to you. This, I should have said this at the beginning. We're filming this and we're also streaming it live. And so the microphone is really for the benefit of people who might be watching on television. And if there aren't questions yet, we'll, uh, we'll talk about the 10-acre economic development site, and then there can be sort of a free-for-all questions on, on any area of the And I'm not leaving, presented. so I'll stick around. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have as we move on. So now I will serve as your uh, computer guru here. All right, thank you. And as... Uh, is the clicker working? It is not working, so I will advance it for you. How's that? That'd be great. Is that yours? Mine, so if you have two batteries, that would be great. So I have just a few slides, and then I will turn it over to Evan, who will probably have more interesting slides of the actual conceptual development plan for the 10 acres site. Uh, but a couple of key things for people to understand as we are as as Peter said for the school project we're also really at a really important period for the 
land use approvals for the 10-acre uh, economic development site. And, and the important step that the council will be considering at work session a week from tonight is a, is a work through of all the, uh, the comments, the board and commission comments on the land use application um, and the responses to those comments. And then that's a setup for council action on that application on May 13th. Um, and at the same time, the council will be considering final action on a comprehensive agreement that lays out all the business terms for the 10-acre economic development also on May 13th. So this is a really busy time for us. Um, it's a time where we're trying to take all the public comment we've gotten over the last six months and really turn it into action in terms of the approvals that the council will consider. So as I noted, this is our 14th uh, uh, meeting on the campus project since we started uh, about 18 months ago uh, on, on this uh, sort of really the detailed planning for this project. And people have seen this slide many times, but to finance the high school, we're, we're intending to issue the $120 million in debt that Peter just mentioned. But the first tranche, the first really big tranche would be this June um, for uh, about half the cost of the project. 63 and a half is what we're notionally planning to finance uh, very shortly. Um, and then the second tranche would be a year from now. So uh, we, we would do that with 30-year bonds, and the debt service on the total debt is about $6 million a year, which is the equivalent of about 15 cents on the tax rate. And that's why the economic development is so important to help finance this project. So we've uh, worked collaboratively with the school board and the city council throughout this process. And after the referendum in 2017, uh, the school sort of went through its column of actions that are taking us to May, where they finalized the plans and the construction con contract. And similarly, the general government is going through its steps over an 18-month period to get to where we will finalize the land lease, which we call the comprehensive agreement, as well as the zoning approvals, which we call the special exception entitlement. Um, and so May is a big month for us, and we're right on the cusp of that. So uh, background um, with the, the EYA P. N. Hoffman Regency team, the city entered into an interim agreement back in December. And what that really did is laid out the schedule to get us to May to, to uh, the actions that we'll be considering um, just in the, in the next couple of months. And it also laid out the material terms, or the key terms of that, um, of this transaction. And so let's talk about what those are. Um, for phase one, the land payments are $34.5 million. For phase two, $10 million, or appraised value, whichever is higher. So that gets you to sort of the base land value of $44.5 million. And then there are two options as well, which total about 6.1 to 7.8 million, and we're still working through those, and we'll keep those um, as options in the comprehensive agreement. Uh, we also have some other financial benefits, such as a capital event payment. Every time the project sells or is refinanced, there will be benefit, financial benefits for the city throughout the 99-year term of this ground lease um, as, as we're working it. The payments for phase one, they don't come all at once, um, but we would be looking for payment one um, in this May-June time frame before we go out to markets uh, for the bonds for the high school. And then a series of payments of $7 million a year starting in 2021 when the development team really takes possession of the property because the new high school is complete, the old high school will be demolished, and then construction can commence for the economic development. And then phase two is um, no later than 2029 as it's laid out in the agreement. Um, so the development program was also laid out here in the interim agreement and then that has then translated into the special exception entitlement, the land use approvals uh, that have gone through the process. So the, the two kickers that I mentioned, one is a community development authority which would be a $2.5 million payment to the city if we create a community development authority that would help fund some of the infrastructure costs for this project. If we do that, um, that would be a, a special tax that would apply only to the 10-acre site. 
uh, to help finance that. Um, the rest of the taxpayers in the city would not um, uh, be paying taxes for that. Uh, the shared garage, uh, that is uh, for a, to construct a shared garage, and I'll show the conceptual plan in just a moment where that would be located. But that reduces costs for the development team, and so the city would receive that benefit uh, with that option. And when I talk about the shared parking garage, uh, that's where that is located. So the new George Mason High School that Peter has uh, walked us through is located here. Mary Ellen Henderson Middle School is here. This is Route 7, and this is Haycock. And so the development program is broken into uh, these blocks, and I won't go into the detailed description of it because uh, Mr. Goldman will do that uh, in much more detail. But that's the basic layout with, uh, with a really strong retail activity in, in this central quarter as well as access, uh, we believe, ultimately through Virginia Tech and uh, on to West Falls Church Metro Station. That's sort of the, the larger vision for how this will function. And when this transportation network is fully constructed, it should alleviate traffic um, that at the Haycock and, and Leesburg Pike, um, improve walkability across Haycock Road so children can walk to school, but also people can get to the site to shop and, um, and, and enjoy the space, and also to be able to walk across Route 7 um, in, a, in, a, in a way that's safe. Um, so we're working through all those transportation details uh, right now with VDOT and with, with Fairfax County. Um, a couple of key uh, dates. May 6th, we'll walk through the documents that uh, we're working on with the City Council at, um, at, uh, at work session. And in addition, on May 6th, the Planning Commission will be considering the subdivision uh, for the site. It would create the, the new parcels that ultimately can, can be conveyed through the ground lease uh, to the development team. Uh, May 13th is the date that's scheduled for City Council consideration of the land use application as well as the comprehensive agreement that lays out all the business terms. And then we have an 18-month period where we will consider the site plan. And that site plan also goes to the City Council. That also will have Board and Commission review and that will be um, that's, that's where the conceptual plans that are approved at the entitlement phase get turned into the detailed plans through site plan. And then 2021 uh, is when construction would, would begin on the 10-acre on the site. So that's a quick overview. Uh, we are uh, taking public comment on the, the land use applications as they've gone through the process, and, and these are the ways that you can do that. This is the direct email to our project manager, Car Carly Aubrey, and this is the direct email to me, and we can then get comments out to everybody from those two locations. So with that, now I'll, uh, I can pause for questions if you have questions for me as, uh, as Mr. Goldman is, is coming forward to give his presentation. All take right. This one. Take that. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Evan Goldman. I'm uh, Executive Vice President of Development and Acquisitions at EYA. It's really nice to be here. Um, I actually recognize almost everyone at this point. So um, most of you have seen my presentation a number of times. Um, so this is um, a copy of our actual um, SEE application that we resubmitted to um, the city um, April 19th, I think it was 22nd. Thank you. And so it's actually quite similar to what we had submitted in February. Um, but the most, mo the big, I'll show you the kind of minor plan-oriented changes. The majority of the changes were really the way we responded to different comments and questions that we received from the boards and commissions. So that's in the written section of our response, and the staff is reviewing that right now. And the reason for that is the SEE is kind of a high-level um, overview of the plan, and so a lot of the more detailed questions are actually things that will be dealt with when we get to SE site plan over the next 12 months. And so 
we're not ignoring any of those issues or, or uh, you know, not agreeing to certain things. We're just pushing them off to the time where we're a little further along with design and have the ability to really answer those questions better. Um, and so you'll see that, uh, I'm sure that conversation will come up in front of the commission next week, um, sorry, uh, council next week. And so um, just to give you a, a little bit of orientation, this diagram looks very similar to everything else we've presented so far. Uh, Leesburg Pike here on the south side, Haycock Road going up and down in this direction. Um, and quite frankly, very little has changed in this blocking diagram. And so I'll give you a great example. Um, we know we've had feedback, quite a bit of feedback already from the schools um, about the height of the hotel and its proximity to the school itself. And so the way we've handled that so far is we've had comments throughout and written responses throughout saying that we will taper the building and pull it back away from the school at, at SE site plan. And so our expectation is that at SE site plan, we'll have a series of meetings with, um, with the school superintendent as well as the school board to talk about the appropriate um, design for that building and ultimately get to something that we'll, you'll see in the SC site plan application. We'll probably have a few meetings prior to application so we can get feedback along the way. And then that way, ideally, what, by the time we've submitted our SESP six or nine months from now, um, we already have buy-in from the schools, but if not, we'll work it out during that SC site plan process. What we didn't want to do is kind of guess now about what it's going to be because we don't know yet. We just haven't designed the building. We're literally reviewing architects um, right now and hiring somebody. And so we'll have a lot more information about that building in the next two to three months. And so that's, the, that's a good example of the types of things that weren't addressed in this modification of the SCE, but will be addressed when we get into the next level. Um, this chart has been expanded a little bit with input from staff, but is the kind of binding elements and the square footages of the various buildings that are included in the plan. Uh, very minor changes from our original submission three months ago, um, religious really clarifications. And then this is one of the changes. So there's, there's two changes that have been inserted into this um, SE package, and I'll show you one of them right now and the other one in a moment. And so this is really the, the largest change. This is an option. And so today, what we had always propo proposed was this split commons drive where the right side of the street goes northbound and the left the left side of the street goes southbound or the west side of the street goes southbound. And this is um, separated by a big median. And what we also did was we had a left turn into the project. We did not have a left turn out of the project. And part of that was to make sure that cars from Chestnut, which in, in accordance with a, an agreement with VDOT, is supposed to be, um, become a right in and right out intersection to stop traffic from flowing through to Chestnut. Um, in order to make it so cars don't illegally cross from our development into that neighborhood, we had shut off the median there to make that happen. So there's some positive to that. The negative of that is it means that any of the cars coming south on Commons Drive, or quite frankly, anyone coming from our project or the school, if they want to go through our project, not from the school itself parking lots, but if they want to go left towards the city, since we're on the edge of the city, they have to come back out through Haycock, which makes the Haycock intersection even worse because there'll be cars waiting to make a left turn there. So there is a benefit that was brought up at the council hearing in May, in February, about being able to have a left turn out of the project. So it is more connected with the city and cars can come from the project leftbound towards the city. And so we proposed an alternate design for that intersection, which pulls those together and creates an open space on the left side of the project in this location. And that by pulling it together, it allows us to create a left turn out of the project and make a geometry here where there's no way that a car can feasibly make an illegal U-turn there or try to get towards a westbound uh, Route 7 lane, which is the concern that there would be accidents as cars are trying to make that movement. And so this is an example of one of the two plan changes. And so this is in here as an alternate, meaning it hasn't been approved yet, but at least there's notice to the community that we're looking at these two options. And then we would go through the process over the next number of months with staff, with VDOT, um, with the council to come to a final conclusion as to exactly how that intersection will be handled. Um, and I think we do lean towards this one because we think it's important to have that connectivity um, into the city, but we can also live with the other option if we aren't able to make that happen. Um, these are uh, 3D axonometrics of the project. And so for the, I think there was one gentleman that this is the first meeting you've been to. Um, this is the level of detail at this phase. And so you're not seeing architecture, you're not seeing all the kind of fun stuff that will happen at SE site plan, uh, but it gives you a sense of massing and so the yellow is residential, the blue is office, the purple is hotel, and the pink is um, senior housing. The red on the bottom of all those buildings is retail. And so this is just a diagram to give people a sense of expectation of how tall buildings might be. 
And this is that same from the other view from the school. Um, and then this diagram, which is in the site plan, is height limitations. And so the whole site is allowed to go to 15 stories. We have limited that height as you get closer to the school. You can see we have a whole bunch of areas where we've limited down the heights in those um, specifically um, to make sure we're not putting the school itself in the shadow. Um, there are some shadow studies in here that have been updated. So there were already some, but we've increased the number of shadow studies um, at the request of um, the schools and some of the local neighbors. Um, there's parking diagrams. This hasn't changed. So the only other change from our original submission was the addition of an alternate bike lane option, which is here. And so we had been showing a true cycle track on the north side of Mustang Alley. Who in here knows what Mustang Alley is? Do all of you know now? OK, wow, that's great. I don't have to say what Mustang Alley is. OK, so on the northern side of our street, this is Mustang Alley. So on the northern side of our project, sorry. And there is a, a desire, correctly, to have a safe bike, bicycle route to the school for students. Um, and so right now, we had shown that as a two-way cycle track that was within the roadway. Um, we had a few comments on that about uh, bicycle safety, concerns about cars going into the cycle track, concerns about people on their bikes being able to get out of the cycle track when they want to, and then concerns about, you know, given that this side, the northern side of our site, won't be developed for a few years until after we finish, that's the Virginia Tech parcel, you know, how will students walk to school along there if they're not on a bike? You know, that's not a, it becomes, it's really dedicated bike lanes versus um, pedestrian way. So one option, whether this is an interim or a long-term solution, is to make it a, a nice big wide shared use path versus dedicated bike lane on that side. Um, and then when Virginia Tech develops to the north of us, it can, that could be converted into a dedicated bike lane because you'll have, you know, a 20 foot wide sidewalk on the other side of that up to the face of the buildings that will be built there. So that could be a solution in the interim. What it does is it gets the bike lane up above the curb. It makes it a little safer on the inside of the trees. Um, but we are flexible between both. We think they're both good solutions. We do think as a temper, as it certainly as an interim, this one may be the better solution because for both bicyclists as well as pedestrians, it works a little bit better. Um, and then that can be converted to a dedicated bike lane two to three years later when Virginia Tech develops. So that's a, the only other real change to the uh, design of the plan. Um, and I think the last thing I'll share for anyone who hasn't seen the plan so far is this concept of the commons itself, which is really the central focus point of the project and the thing that we're um, probably most excited about is creating this great placemaking environment. And um, we do have a, we had had a lower tree count um, in our original plan just because we had miscalculated something that's been corrected. We have a higher tree canopy coverage now. That was just a, a miscalculation originally. And, um, but these images give you a sense for the idea of making it lush and green and exciting and landscaped, very, very conceptual at this point. But the idea is to bring people here, have it be a draw for the community. Um, and this gives you kind of a sense of the paving materials and, and landscaping. And so when we get into the next stage, which would be SC site plan, all of that will be heavily detailed out. And you'll get to see placemaking elements and landscape elements and hardscape. And it'll, it'll really come to life over the next uh, nine months or so. So those are the. Uh, that's really it. Um, not a ton has changed from our original presentation, but I'm happy to answer any questions anybody has. I'll just go back to the original plan. Uh, there we go. Anyone have any questions? Everyone has seen our presentations at this point 76 times, so they don't have any more questions. <laughs> I'll hand it back to Wyatt. All right. While people are thinking of questions they might ask, I will just note that uh, one question we often get is the uh, coordination or the communication that we're having with our neighbors, uh, with Virginia Tech and with WMATA, speaking of the neighbors who, who land, own property adjacent to this site. And uh, Virginia Tech is in the process right now of going through a public-private partnership um, agreement for the uh, redevelopment of the Northern Virginia Center. And um, they haven't made any decisions on that, but uh, they are in the, sort of their top ranked respondent um, is the Rushmark um, HIT team. And our EYA, PN Hoffman Regency team has been meeting with their team just to go through design issues, 
um, the vision has always been for Virginia Tech because Virginia Tech really started thinking about this site at the city's initiative uh, when, when we began four years ago planning out our 10-acre site. And, um, and, and Virginia Tech has stated its commitment to uh, whatever they do on their site to do it in a way that's thoughtful and that coordinates well with what we're trying to do on our site. Um, so more to come on that, but I think the, the communication has been, been, I think, effective on that. And then WMATA is also going through a comp plan amendment with Fairfax County and also trying to think about their property um, in a way about transit-oriented development, about walkability, about having um, activity that will, will work well with our high school and uh, Virginia Tech and ultimately what we're trying to build on the 10-acre site. Yes, sir. Thank you. Have there been any further developments about the shared use of the parking structure between the school and the West End? The basic idea is um, that 187 spaces in that garage would be exclusively for the schools. The schools would own it, operate it, control who goes in and who goes out. Um, and then also have the ability during special events for the schools, for athletic events or PTA or back to school nights to have um, additional usage of the garage. That's, that's the plan that we're, that we're uh, proceeding with. Um, Dr. Noonan, any other comments on that? No, I think that covers it. Um, but yeah, no, I think that covers it. It, it does. It does remain an option, however, and so um, as we're going through, uh, going through the process, it is possible that that could, at the end of the day, still be a surface lot that is, that is controlled fully by the schools. So that still remains an option. Under that option, really, the only thing that would change is where people park. Um, the basic program would remain the same with some, some sort of minor adjustments. Uh, but I think it's important for people to sort of keep that idea in mind as we're going forward that that does remain an option. So, so Paul, just to sort of put a, a final point on it, um, what that 187 exclusive spaces in that garage, or if the garage isn't there, the 187 surface spaces that we have um, would, it, would then give us 400 spaces at the high school, middle school, which is uh, what we've said all along that we'd be able to accommodate. Out of 400 total for the for the garage. I oh, oh, I don't. Know. I believe it's around 800 spaces in total. 800. Thank you. Um, are are you seeing the Virginia Tech and WMATA projects as being follow-ons to this project, or might we be seeing construction on three projects at the same time? It's a little bit hard for me to answer. We would need our partners really to answer that question. Um, I do think that they are a little bit behind us, but but I, you know, I, I can't speak definitively for their schedule. Uh, yeah, the only thing I, I would share is that the comp for the other two projects to redevelop, they need a comprehensive plan amendment um, in Fairfax County, which will take roughly 18 months, um, you know, 12 to 18 months, if not slightly more. And then they have to go through the um, site, essentially the sketch plan or SESP -E equivalent plan for um, Fairfax County. So, you know, our, our assumption is that they're probably two years behind us. And the timing of our two projects, the high school and the economic development, our um, the high school obviously would go first and then the economic development behind that. Why you talked about shared use by the city, by the school board on special events. Are you also considering special events by, for citywide events, rec, rec and park events um, for the shared usage when the rec and park has uh, events up at the community center, I mean up at uh, the campus? Yes, and so the ones that we are envisioning, 4th of July, certainly. Um, now we need to kind of 
think about how Fourth of July fireworks are going to work on this site when there's much more activity up there. But um, our goal is to keep that happening up there, subject to the fire marshal's approval. Um, the other, currently, you know, what happens up there for Barrecan Parks probably wouldn't require that surge parking. But as we hammer out that shared parking agreement, what the development team has asked for is to have some pre-planning so that there is a schedule for when those when we would be using the surge parking, and um, and so you know as we're thinking through the calendar, we would identify those rec and park nights or, or weekends when we'd want to use it as well and try to plan ahead for it. Thank you. In terms of the criteria that would be used to decide between the surface and the structure of the parking lot, uh, what are the criteria? What are the considerations? What it would seem like having the structure would be an awful lot better. What, what are the downsides other than cost? Um, there are a lot of benefits to it. And um, so the criteria. Um, you know, I think ultimately we we feel very comfortable with this plan. I think that's probably the best way to describe it. Um, and so I guess all I would say is just to remind people that there is that option, that, that as even after we go through the comprehensive agreement phase, that that may remain still a point of discussion. And so that that detail, that site plan phase is, is where we can work through those issues. Um, of sort of what the pros and cons would be. I think that's the way I would describe it now. But in the interim agreement, and really through all of our discussions with the comprehensive agreement, um, it has been characterized as an, as an option, and so that, that's why I'm just highlighting that. Everybody here has heard this about 100 <laughs> times, pretty much. <laughs> What's uh, what are the are the, what are the existing risks or concerns that uh, you have to resolve in order to be willing able to sign these uh, documents in next month? Um, you know, I know concerns from some people in Fairfax County. Where does that stand? So um, one thing that. Um, has been part of the planning process from the beginning is when we did the boundary adjustment with Fairfax County, there was an agreement with Fairfax County that 70% of the school parcels would be used for education uses um, over the next 50 years, and 30% of the parcels could be used for any other lawful use to, as determined by the city. And it also spells out that where that 30% is at the sole discretion of the city. Um, we have been in discussions with county. There, we've been um, meeting with the county really throughout our planning process for this. But when we selected the EYA PN Hoffman team, uh, we w met with county officials just to go through this plan. And now we're in discussions with them just about this plan in the context of that agreement and any other transportation or other comments that they might have. And so that, that uh, coordination and discussion is happening right now. So that's uh, one area of work. The comprehensive agreement, um, the interim agreement, I think did a really good job of laying out what the sort of the big interests are for the city. Um, and a lot of negotiation went into that interim agreement in those material terms. But now we're turning those into a very lengthy and complex commercial real estate uh, document. And so there are plenty of things to talk about in that negotiation. And uh, so we're still doing that work. Um, we'll be briefing the city council on May 6th. The council will really get to uh, go through um, uh, those documents and confirm that the material terms have been reflected properly in the comprehensive agreement. Um, and, and so that's really the, the main area of work that's happening right now. One other area of work is on the voluntary concessions that are associated with the special exception entitlement. And, and that's where the board and commission comments. We want to do our best to reflect those comments in the voluntary concessions. 
um, so that statements that are made are actually documented um, in, in a way that can be enforced as, uh, you know, four years from now when the project is, is, um, is completed. So as I said, this is, a, this is a very intense time of work to get these documents ready for, for the Council's consideration. Okay. Well, thank you all. Yeah, Mary. Could you just say a couple of words about the CDA and in terms of the additional money that the city would receive and what the balancing risk is to the city uh, and benefit to the developer? So a community development authority, um, here's the idea. It would be set up with basically the, the boundaries of the economic development parcel. And the community development authority would be chartered by the city council. Um, it's, it would have a governing body that would be appointed by the city council. And that authority would, would <clears throat> it, under Virginia law, it has the ability to issue bonds. And so, uh, the bonds can be used uh, to build infrastructure for the site and the way the debt service of those bonds would be covered would be through a tax on this land and, and the and improvements on it. What is conceptually being discussed is a special taxing district of, a, of possibly 15 cents uh, on the, for $100 of real estate value uh, for this site. Um, and the question is, how much money would that generate and how much debt can that support? And uh, so that is what's being worked out right now. In the comprehensive agreement, we want to have an understanding of sort of what the basic assumptions are for the CDA. Um, in the comprehensive agreement, there won't be an obligation that we will create the CDA, but we'll have a term sheet that says, here's what our expectations for it and what it would be. Um, and then, you know, with eyes open, uh, the opportunity for that CDA still would remain in the comprehensive agreement. Um, the risks to the city, um, the, in the interim agreement, it does state that the city would provide its moral backing for these bonds. And so what that means is if there's a casualty, i.e., you know, something happens to the property so that the tax yield um, is not what was expected, then as a backstop, it could be that the city government would need to cover those bonds. That's what the moral obligation would be. Now that um, is something that we would want to insulate the city from, um, that the sort of the first backstop is the taxable value right here and that they could raise taxes to cover that rather than the, the other taxpayers of the city. Um, but those are the things that we would have then 18 months to really hammer out exactly how that would look with the benefit of bond council, et cetera. Um, so at this point in the process, we're really thinking about it from the perspective of what are some of the base assumptions, almost like a term sheet for creating a community development authority, and then uh, decisions on it can be made at a later date. Does that answer your question? And from the developer's perspective, they will be able to borrow money at less cost. Is that correct? So the developer would not be borrowing money. The CDA would be and would be covering a portion of the, co of the infrastructure for the site. So what that does is, to the benefit of the developer is that uh, the developer is responsible for all the infrastructure on the site. The CDA would help finance a portion of that. And so how valuable it is to the developer really depends on kind of what those assumptions are of what the ultimate tax yield from the CDA could generate and therefore how much debt it could safely support. Um, that, that's the kind of the, the, the calculations that need to be made. Um, CDA is like the Mosaic uh, District that has a community development authority. There are uh, several examples in Fairfax County 
um, and dozens of examples throughout the Commonwealth, Commonwealth of Virginia. So it's not a, a terribly unusual instrument, but it's one the city's never done before, and so uh, we'll, we'll look at it very closely. Okay. Well, thank you all very much for coming. We really appreciate your time, and um, Wyatt and I will stick around. If you have any questions, thoughts, or comments, we'd certainly be happy to, to stand and, and chat with you. Indeed. And May 6th is a work session, and so that's typically not an opportunity for public comment. That'll be a, a chance for the City Council to, to discuss it with staff, with the development team, and, um, and then on May 13th we'll have a public hearing on that, and everybody's uh, welcome to both meetings, uh, the May 13th being uh, the next opportunity for public comment. So thank you all for and, being here tonight. And, and we'll have a work session on May 7th, uh, where we'll be talking about the GMP, the greatest maximum price that I mentioned earlier, and uh, we will um, plan to adopt that on uh, May 14th. So you're all welcome to that as well. All right. Thank you for coming tonight.